Welcome to ECE 552, lecture on benchmarks, means, and Amdahl's law. All of the analysis to this point has assumed that we know uh, that we know that we're executing a single program and what that program is. Uh, however, uh, that's oftentimes not the case. We don't know what program we always want to we want, we actually care about running. Um, in the best case, of course, you always run either a single program or the same set of programs, so you know exactly. Uh, what you care about and how those programs behave. You can measure them on the real systems and uh, make very well-informed decisions about performance and cost of the, real, of the individual machines or the respective machines. Uh, in reality, however, we don't have access to the actual programs that end users are going to want to run because they may not even have been written yet. Uh, so oftentimes we'll use what are called benchmarks. Benchmarks are just programs that are chosen to measure performance. They predict the performance of an actual workload. Uh, you save an awful, awful lot of effort and money by using uh, a set of benchmarks because you can carry over that effort from one design process to the next design process. As long as everyone agrees that these are relevant and useful and meaningful benchmarks, uh, it's uh, a much more straightforward process than to stick with that standard set of benchmarks. Now, a lot of questions arise when you do this. Um, are these benchmarks really representative of what users are actually using their systems for? Are we honestly uh, measuring these perform the, the performance of these benchmarks? Uh, and we really start getting into marketing, or what's sometimes called benchmarketing, uh, when people uh, play games with benchmarks to try to make their particular system look better than anyone else's. And there have been lots and lots of examples of this kind of abuse uh, in the industry over the years. Now, if you have a set of benchmarks or a set of programs that you're running on one on multiple machines to uh, try to compare their performance, the other issue that comes up is how do we average the performance of these machines and of the programs on these machines? So one way to uh, average the performance of multiple programs on a particular machine is illustrated on this slide. We can simply add up the total execution time for machine A, which adds up to 1,001 seconds, and the total execution time for machine B, which adds up to 110 seconds. And we can simply take the ratio now of the total execution time to determine which machine is faster. So in this case, we would divide 1,001 by 110 and come up with a 9.1x speed up of machine B over machine A. An alternative way to look at this is to think of it as the arithmetic mean. It really gives us the same result. The math is slightly different. The arithmetic mean of times is defined as the sum of the times of all of the individual benchmarks divided by the number of benchmarks. This is pretty straightforward math here. Uh, so in this particular case, the arithmetic mean for machine A would be 1,001 divided by 2, or 500.5. The arithmetic machine of B would be 110 divided by 2, or 55. And again, if we now take the speed up as the ratio of the two arithmetic means, we end up with the same speed up factor of 9.1x. Uh, this kind of approach is really only valid if the programs are equally important or run equally often. Um, if they are not, you can use what's called a weighted arithmetic mean. And the only difference here is that you simply as assign a weight uh, to each benchmark, and when you're computing the uh, weighted arithmetic mean, you simply include that uh, as a term uh, in the summation process. There are also alternative ways to average uh, numbers together. Uh, and an illustrative example of this would be um, if you're driving in an automobile, and you're going 30 miles per hour for the first 10 miles, and then 90 miles per hour for the next 10 miles, what is your average speed? Well, uh, it's obviously not the average of these two numbers. If you simply add 30 and 90 together and divide by 2, uh, you get 60 miles per hour, but that's clearly not correct. So what do we actually have to do here? To compute the average speed, we have to compute the total distance and divide that by the total time. Uh, we can do that, again, by um, adding up the total distance, which in this case is going to be 20 miles, and the total time, which again is determined by the ratio, the sum of the two ratios, 10 over 30 and 10 over 90. Uh, and if we do the math here, we end up with an average speed of 45 miles per hour, which is very different from the average, average speed that we got when we first computed it incorrectly as 60. To simplify the process of dealing with rates, we can use what's called a harmonic mean. And the harmonic mean is the equation for a harmonic mean is shown here. It seems a little bit complicated, but it really uh, isn't that bad. 
typically if you're used if you're forced to start and end with rates like in the previous example we were talking about miles per hour which is a rate of speed for a vehicle uh, but again a MIPS or megaflops is similarly a rate um, where the again the time unit is in the, is is in the denominator in this case the second is in the denominator um, if we need to average these kinds of numbers together, we should use a harmonic mean. The reasoning behind this is it gets a little bit technical and tricky. If you're curious, there's a very good paper written by one of my former colleagues, uh, Jim Smith, that's cited here on the slide. But it basically comes down to the fact that the, uh, in a rate, the time is in the denominator, and the mean that we compute should be proportional to the inverse of the sums of the time instead of the sums of the inverses. And when you use the harmonic mean, you end up actually uh, achieving that goal. Now, oftentimes, uh, we're stuck with trying to deal with ratios. So let's look at this from the perspective of an example. If we have two machines, again, machine A and machine B. The execution times for two programs on these two machines are shown in the table. Um, if we now normalize these execution times or take ratios of these execution times with respect to machine A, we end up with just ones in the column for machine A, and we end up with 10.1 and an average of 5.05 now for machine B. So uh, basically the ratios would be machine A with respect to itself has a performance of 1, and machine B with respect to machine A has a performance of 5.05. Sounds good enough so far. However, if we now take the ratios with respect to machine B, again, we end up with 1s in the column for machine B, but now we end up with 0 0.1, 10, and 5.05 for machine A. So what does this mean? can't both be true, right? It can't be that uh, if we take ratios with respect to machine A, uh, B is faster, but if we take ratios with respect to machine B, A is faster. These, these facts can't both be true. They're internally inconsistent with each other. Now, the issue here is the, the, that we're, again, using the arithmetic mean to compute these ratios. So we're taking the arithmetic mean of program one and program two on machine A and the arithmetic mean of program one and program two on machine B uh, to compute the average and then we're comparing these averages with each other. And that is really uh, not something that you should do. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense as this example clearly illustrates. What you want to do instead is use something called the geometric mean whenever you're dealing again with ratios, meaning things like speed ups, A is this much faster than B, that's a ratio. Uh, if I want to compute a mean of those kinds of ratios, then uh, I really should uh, use the geometric mean. The geometric mean is defined as the nth root of the product of all of the ratios in the set that you're uh, trying to find the average over the mean of. Uh, it ends up being independent of the reference machine that you use to compute the ratios, which is a nice property to have. Uh, in the previous example, the geometric mean for machine A is 1, and for machine B, it's also 1. And so it's normalized now with respect to either machine, and we end up with a, a result that is at least somewhat meaningful. However, geometric means have their own set of challenges. Uh, we should remember that the geometric mean of ratios is really uh, not proportional in any way to total time of execution. Uh, so for example, the uh, arithmetic mean in the example tells us that B is 9.1 times faster, but the geometric mean says they are equal. If we looked at total execution time uh, in this scenario, A and B would be equal only if program one is 100 times more important or is run 100 times more frequently than program two. Uh, which we don't really have that information. We don't really know if that's true or not. Uh, in general, uh, geometric mean is a poor predictor for this for uh, actual execution time, especially if you're comparing uh, three or more machines. So then, summarizing our discussion of how to compute means or averages, uh, if you have times of execution, you're fine using arithmetic mean. Uh, if you're forced to use rates like MIPS or megaflops, you should use harmonic mean. Uh, if you're forced to use ratios like speed ups, uh, then you should use geometric mean. Uh, best of all, you should use unnormalized numbers uh, to compute time and report those results whenever possible. Selection of benchmarks is a very, very important problem in our industry. Uh, as an example of a standardized benchmark suite, we'll talk briefly about a benchmark suite called SPEC 2000. Uh, SPEC 2000 was put together by something called the Systems Performance Evaluation Co Cooperative, which is an industry consortium that was formed in the 1980s 
to try to combat this benchmarking problem where every vendor was using their own set of benchmarks. It became very difficult to make any kind of reasonable and realistic and believable comparisons across machines. Uh, so to combat that problem, uh, they defined initially the Spec 89 suite of benchmarks, but there's been a sequence of updates uh, ever since then, Spec 92, Spec 95, all the way through Spec 2006. Now the Spec 2000 version, of course, came out in the year 2000. It consisted of 12 integer and 14 floating point programs. Uh, the performance uh, of whatever machine was being benchmarked was um, normalized as a ratio against uh, a particular workstation from Sun Microsystems that had a 300 megahertz uh, UltraSpark processor in it that had a score of 100. Um, all of the uh, machines that were then benchmarked with the suite uh, would report the geometric mean of the ratios of each of these benchmarks against this particular reference machine. This slide lists the uh, integer benchmarks in the SPEC 2000 benchmark suite. As you can see uh, from the descriptions here, these are real programs that people use uh, to, to do real engineering work or to uh, compile code or to do optimization tasks or to compress files or uh, to do any of a number of any of a number of real world tasks. So one of the goals of SPEC was to include programs that represent uh, what real users are using uh, their computers for. Similarly, this slide shows the floating point benchmarks, and again, there's a lot of simulation, uh, neural networks, etc., lots of uh, different kinds of applications that were in common use uh, in this time frame. There are a number of pitfalls that come into play when we're dealing with benchmarks. Uh, for example, the benchmark might not be representative. If your workload is bound by input and output, if you're mostly waiting for packets to come in off the network or mostly waiting to write uh, large files out to disk, then a benchmark like SPEC is, is useless in terms of uh, estimating the performance of a particular machine uh, for, your, for your workload. So you have to make sure that the benchmarks themselves um, are a good match for what it is that you're actually interested in. Uh, could be that the benchmark is too old. Benchmarks do not age well. Because of this pressure to do benchmarking, vendors will optimize their compilers, their hardware, uh, their software stacks to match the benchmarks. And so over time, because of this over-optimization, uh, the benchmarks really become less and less representative of what you would actually see with your own set of programs that haven't had this kind of optimization applied to them. And so benchmark suites need to be periodically refreshed for them to remain meaningful. And that's uh, why we see um, that sequence of, of benchmarks that have come out of spec, for example. Moving on a little bit here to a new topic, we want to introduce the notion of, uh, or the concept of Amdahl's Law. Amdahl's Law was uh, first presented by Gene Amdahl, who, by the way, is a UW graduate. Um, uh, Amdahl really uh, put this simple analytical model together to help people understand a little bit better uh, what happens in, in computer systems when you optimize a particular piece of the system or a particular piece of the program that you're running, uh, what the overall effect of those kinds of changes are. Uh, and we can use it to motivate uh, the sort of rule of thumb that we use a lot of the time, which is to optimize for the common case. So we really, the idea here is that you want to focus your efforts on uh, changes to your design that will affect the common case rather than the rare case. So uh, we can derive Amdahl's law very simply by computing speed up. Uh, again, speed up is the ratio of the time in the baseline or old design divided by the uh, runtime on the new design, uh, or flip those around the ratio of the new rate to the old rate. Uh, so if we have some <coughs> optimization um, that will speed up a fraction f of the execution time of a program by a factor of s. So uh, let's say the first half of the program, you can have a 2x impro improvement uh, but the second half of the program, you don't have any improvement, for example. That would be an, uh, two ex uh, an example of an, of an optimization that only helps part of your program, but not all of it. Uh, we can now compute the new time required to execute your program by uh, saying that the 1 minus f fraction is unchanged, so that's at the old time, and uh, the other fraction now um, is basically now uh, factor faster by a factor of s, so we divide by s and multiply by old time. We add those two things together for the two pieces of your program, and we have the new time. We can compute the speed up over the old time by, again, computing the ratio of the old time and the new time. And if we plug in the equation that we just derived, 
Uh, we can now compute the speed up, looking at a little more, a little bit more nicely presented in the equation form here. Uh, we can see that there are some terms that cancel out, and if we simplify this, uh, we end up with uh, speed up being expressed as one over one minus f plus f over s. Uh, just simply mathematically looking at this, we can see that if f, the fraction that you're actually changing, um, if that's small, um, whatever the value of s is, it'll have a limited impact because essentially that term f over s will be very small itself. 1 minus f will dominate, will be very close to 1, and so this ratio will be very close to 1. So this motivates us to make sure that we are spending time coming up with mechanisms that give us nice speed up fraction uh, factors of S for portions of the program that are as large as possible. So we really want F to be very large so that the optimization that we apply uh, is broadly applicable. Here's a quick example of uh, applying Amdahl's law. Let's say your boss asks you to consider two different ways of improving performance. Let's say you can find some way to improve the arithmetic logic unit, uh, which is busy 95% of the time. So 95% of your program's execution time is using the ALU, and you have some way to make that 10% uh, faster. Or alternatively, you could improve the memory pipeline, accessing operands from memory, uh, which 5% of the time you're waiting for these operands from memory, uh, but you can make that 10 times faster. Which of these would really uh, make more sense uh, to pursue? Uh, now, think about this, right? We're improving the ALU by 10%, which seems like a modest improvement. Uh, and that's, in fact, true. Uh, that wouldn't be too difficult to come up with a way to, to improve it by 10%. Uh, the memory pipeline, however, improving that by a factor of 10. I mean, that's a pretty heroic accomplishment, getting a factor of 10 improvement there. Uh, so how do these pan out? Well, if we plot these in the table and use Amdahl's law shown at the bottom here to compute the speed up, we see that uh, uh, the ALU optimization shown in the first row there affects 95% of your program. And even though it's only a modest 10% speed up, we get an overall speed up of 1.094 because, again, F is very large. Uh, improving the memory pipeline, on the other hand, only helps 5% of the time. So even a factor of 10 improvement gives us something a little bit under 5% speed up. In fact, we could even uh, dream up a way to make our memory pipeline infinitely fast, essentially take zero time. And even in that case, because again, we're only affecting 5% of the execution time, we end up with a speed up that's approximately 5%. Uh, and this just illustrates the fact that uh, optimizing for an uncommon case, which in this case is the memory pipeline, will only help you so much. Uh, and even, even if you make it ideal, uh, you're only going to help uh, by uh, an amount that's roughly proportional to uh, the F term in Amdahl's law. If we take the limit of Amdahl's law, the equation, as s approaches infinity, uh, this is really just generalizing the scenario that I just outlined on the previous slide, we see that it simplifies to 1 over 1 minus f. If we plot that on a graph where the x-axis varies f from 0 to 1, we see that the speed up, of course, is um, trivial, uh, almost useless for small values of f. But as f approaches 1, uh, the speed up actually uh, goes up exponentially towards infinity. Uh, so this, again, just reiterates that we really want to be in this range over here on the right-hand side where uh, the optimization that we're applying, which is providing the speed up, is broadly applicable to a large fraction of your program. If we're over here on the left-hand side, the benefit is going to be marginal uh, at best. However, Amdahl's law not only reminds us to focus on the common case, it also reminds us in a very clear way that we have to also consider the uncommon case, especially if we're targeting optimizations that provide a very, very large uh, opportunity for speed up. Uh, so the point here is that if the remaining portion, 1 minus f, is non-trivial, the speed up is going to be limited essentially by that fraction. Uh, it doesn't really matter uh, how effective we are at optimizing f. Uh, if 1 minus f is left alone, it's not going to amount to much. The speed up is going to be limited by that fraction. Uh, this is particularly obvious in cases where we're trying to exploit parallelism in the large, where the large s is not necessarily very cheap. So a common example of this is these days you can buy a graphics processing unit or a GPU card for your, for your system that has 1,024 processors or even more. 
are called shader cores. Uh, for these kinds of uh, the kinds of applications that run effectively on these kinds of uh, GPUs, uh, the parallel portion, the portion of your program that can execute across all of these 1024 processors in parallel, is going to speed up by a proportional factor. Let's say 1024x. So S is going to be 1024x, uh, which is a tremendous, fantastic, you know, great kind of speed up. You know, we, we'd love to have that kind of speed up all the time. However, any serial portion of your code is going to dramatically limit your speed up, that 1 minus F portion. The portion that doesn't run in parallel on these thousand cores and just chugs along serially on the rest of your system. So for example, if your program spends 90% of its time running in parallel mode, but still spends 10% of its time in serial mode, it seems like you know we're doing the right thing by optimizing for that 90% case. But we need to remember that in that case, that serial portion of 0.1 you plug that into the limit version of Amdahl's law is going to restrict us to a 10x speed up. So again, we're going to spend an awful lot of resource and cost and power to uh, include a thousand cores in our systems uh, to get this benefit in the parallel section, but our application overall is still only going to speed up by 10x. We talked briefly about benchmarks, looking at the SPEC 2000 suite as an example benchmark suite. There are many others out there. Uh, we talked about summarizing performance uh, using arithmetic means for time, harmonic means for rates, and geometric means for ratios. And finally, we talked briefly about Amdahl's Law as a useful tool that reminds us to focus on the common case, first of all, but second of all, to not neglect uh, the uncommon case. <laughs>